Welcome to Second Take, the show that focuses on the issues behind the news. It's been another turbulent week on the electricity front, with ongoing high levels of load shedding, the launch of a lawsuit against ESCOM's grid queuing rules, and false and confusing statements about the decommissioning of Kumati. Terence Kremer joins me to discuss the week's developments. Welcome, Terence. Hi, Sashni. Now, as load shedding bites, uh, concern is rising over Kuburg. Yes, now load shedding, as we know, we've had another very intense period of load shedding. Since the snows in Gauteng, it's been quite intense and the sort of stage four uh, that we're at. And the good thing is that the fears of stage eight haven't materialized for this winter, but it has been uh, still a very difficult period. And we're starting to see it come through now in company financial results, particularly those that require electricity to mm. produce their products. We saw very poor results. Um, uh, uh, from ArcelorMittal this week where they made a loss of nearly 500 million rand. In the period last year, uh, they made a 3 billion rand profit and they didn't expect this period to be this bad. And it was really about disruption from the production at their, on their, their own mills. 41 or so events of load curtailment versus four for the whole of last year. This is just in an interim period. And, but more importantly, we've seen the, the downstream demand uh, having been curtailed as people cut back on production mm. shifts, uh, much lower confidence, a lot around uh, load shedding. And then, as you say, we've got this period now that we're coming into the summer period. We were hoping for some relief with Kuburg, uh, one of the Kuburg units coming back, other one obviously going off, and then some of the Kusila units coming on. But there is concern that there's going to be an overlap between Unit 1 and Unit 2's outage at Kuburg, mm. which, as we enter the summer maintenance season, does make the system vulnerable. Now, there could be another delay in renewables procurement with an ongoing court case. Yes, that's been the big problem and disappointment about how we've attacked this electricity crisis. We haven't added new generation capacity at anything like the type of scale that we need to close the gap of say 4,000 megawatts, which is stage four of load shedding, which we're currently in. And the quickest way to do that was to get the renewables going. Now we know we had that seven year disruption, a state captured Eskom decision not to sign power purchase agreements, which led to uh, no procurement, uh, public procurement for seven years. Those bid window four projects have only just recently, that were procured all the way back in 2014, have only recently come in. We know that when we restarted, it's been a really uh, difficult affair. We had a very badly designed so-called risk mitigation or emergency mm. bid window. Not one of those uh, kilowatt hours are yet in the grid. Uh, we have one project that's fairly advanced, but the, as we know, the, the car power ships never came in, probably thankfully given the cost of that. But there's still, uh, that is still open. That program is still open and car power ship is still moving ahead with uh, processes to try and get the environmental authorizations, which they haven't had until now, that we really haven't added. And in the process, we have made reforms that have made it possible for private to private uh, generation projects to come on. But in the process, the grid constraints have come to the fore. And uh, Eskim, in trying to manage those, that this um, grid constraint, has put in new queuing rules for everyone. Um, to because what happened with the bid window six is that uh, the projects that had bid under the for the wind allocation of 3,200 megawatts were dislodged by others taking uh, uh, getting b budget quotes for that same very same grid capacity. Um, so Eskom went through a process, a very uh, I think truncated process of consultation around how we should put in new grid queuing rules, and they moved from a first come first serve approach to first ready, first serve um, uh, model, which was announced literally a couple of weeks ago. And now there's a court case around that. Um, one of the developers that has, uh, is at risk of losing the um, budget quote from Eskom has taken it to court. And uh, we should know quite soon whether they, this, process, this uh, new approach is interdicted. But the knock-on effects could be quite significant if we don't get some certainty around this. Uh, bid window seven supposed to start uh, in September, and uh, we, were, we were waiting for you know Eskom to give the latest insight of what grid is available. But if these rules uh, of how to access the grid 
are not sorted out and there's legal uncertainty, it could lead to further delays. Now, the electricity minister's comments on Kamati has also caused a stir. Yes, I mean, we live in the world of alternative facts all over the world. And in South Africa, too, it seems alternative facts are coming to the fore. And he made statements that were really fact-free around Kamati. He's suggesting that Kamati could have still been producing 1,000 megawatts uh, and injecting that into the grid, suggesting that Kamati is one of the best performing power stations when it was closed late last year. That's just not true. Uh, Kamati was producing around 120 megawatts when, uh, when the power station was eventually closed at its end of its legal life. And uh, it would have been very difficult for Eskom and very expensive for Eskom to try and extend that license. Uh, it had nine units at its peak. It was down to one. There had been a cannibalization of some of the parts to take those parts to the younger power stations. This had nothing to do with the Just Energy Transition Partnership, which was, uh, was announced. Um, and to blame that is, is almost ludicrous. In fact, the JET or the uh, JET strategy, the Just Energy strategy of Eskom was, you know, emerged during those COVID period, really, to try and find a way to look at stations like Komati, like Andrina, that are scheduled. <laughs> and they've been scheduled in the uh, integrated resource plan for decommissioning and to see if there's any way to repower and repurpose them to try and develop some uh, economic activity for the communities in that area, as well as to use the, the very valuable grid infrastructure that's there. And that's really, and this predated, the commodity stuff actually predated the JetP and the money that's flowed from the World Bank predated the JetP. So there's actually to, to be blaming the JetP or, uh, or the $8.5 billion um, offer to support South Africa's energy transition uh, is just not factually correct. And I think it causes a lot of confusion. It's basically uh, the cause and effect, you know, to, to be blaming the transition and renewables uh, for what is really a coal problem and mismanagement, not only with the existing coal assets, really badly managed, with corruption to boot, and then we've had a really bad coal build program where we've got projects that started in 2007. Madupi, one unit is, okay, it exploded, but it's not operating. Kusile, it's got one unit operating. You know, it's, it's outrageous to be uh, blaming the transition and renewables for load shedding when these are the sort of things that have happened uh, on the coal fleet side. And then we know the energy availability factor. So I think um, it is dangerous to have this sort of fact-free narrative and we've seen what it's done politically in the rest of the world to have it, but this is the world we live in. And we have to actually tell people when they are making absolutely false statements, and that's what I'm doing today. Thanks for speaking with us, Terence. Thank you. That's it for today. Join us again next week for more news analysis. To subscribe to Crema Media's Engineering News and Mining Weekly, please email subscriptions at cremamedia.co.za.